acknowledge that. But uh, this is again on Color Coins by Super Testnet uh, regarding uh, Layer Three on Bitcoin. So Super, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Thank you everybody for coming to the presentation on colored coins. Today we're going to go over a couple of different things. We're going to go over what colored coins are, what they look like, some examples of them, the history of colored coins, and a demonstration of uh, something I've been making uh, in the colored coin um, space. So that's, uh, that's what we'll get into. Let's, let's jump right in. <clears throat> so what's a colored coin? Um, some of you may have heard of them before. A colored coin is a small amount of data in a Bitcoin transaction. And I want to mention that um, it's true of it's not just true of uh, colored coins. It's not just true of um, well, it's it's uh, as, what what I'm saying here about it being a small piece of text. That's also true of every Bitcoin. Like every Bitcoin is also a small piece of text, and so is every stablecoin, and so is every NFT. Anything that goes on a blockchain is text, um, and so that's uh, that's what we're dealing with here. Um, these ones occur inside Bitcoin transactions, and when they're present, uh, they represent an asset other than Bitcoin. Stable coins represent uh, a, a physical dollar and um, NFTs represent a piece of art. Or typically they represent a piece of art. Sometimes it's like a film or a, or a GIF or, a, or something else. Colored coins can be transferred from one Bitcoin address to another in the same manner as Bitcoins themselves. And that's what kind of makes them cool um, is that these things, aren't, these things aren't Bitcoins. They represent uh, often real world assets and uh, you can represent the ownership transfers on Bitcoin. Um, uh, using using colored colored coins, some of the projects that use them include BISC. BISC is a decentralized exchange, and they have a token called BSQ, which is a governance token on their exchange. Uh, what that means is, you, if you have the BSQ token, you can use it to like vote on protocol changes and uh, hiring other developers to work on it and stuff like that. Um, also, people who hold BSQ get cheaper exchange fees on that exchange. Another use of them is by the corporation called Tether. They use colored coins to issue stable coins on Bitcoin's blockchain. Uh, they also issue stable coins on a bunch of other blockchains like uh, Tron and Ethereum and um, Liquid and, and some others, but uh, Bitcoin is one of them. And then there's Rare Pepes, which are an, uh, a meme NFT. Um, uh, they are, I'll, I'll show a little bit of what they look like later, but uh, they're a popular um, NFT project. So uh, here is a picture of a colored coin transaction that is uh, that I uh, took from blockstream.info. This is using a colored coin protocol called Omni, which I'll describe a bit later. Um, but this is what a colored coin transa transaction looks like on the blockchain. Uh, like a normal transaction, uh, this is the previous transaction that got the coins into the sender's address. Over here, you have the recipient addresses. Uh, there are two of them here. One of them is probably a change address where he's he's got, you know, 0.004 Bitcoins, and he's sending most of that back to himself. Um, the other recipient here is getting um, a small amount of Satoshis, 546 sats. And this address here is um, the recipient of the colored coins as well. So the, the, these are Bitcoins, these are Bitcoins, these are Bitcoins. Where are the colored coins? And the answer is in this thing right here, OpReturn. Um, so many of you probably haven't heard of OpReturn before, but if, uh, in case you haven't, uh, OpReturn is... Um, a, uh, a, pr um, a function within Bitcoin's scripting language, uh, which if you use it, it allows you to add any text you want onto the blockchain, uh, up to 80 bytes of text. 80 bytes is about 160 letters or numbers. Um, so that's what you can use OpReturn for. And if you do use OpReturn, then uh, other nodes on the network don't like validate what's in that, what's in that piece of text you added. They don't, they don't care, it can be anything. Could be an image. It could be a piece of piece of music if you can fit it into 80 bytes. Um, they don't really care what's in there, and miners don't care either. As long as it's under 80 bytes, they'll just process it, put it into a block, move right along. And so you can use this to put poems and stuff into the blockchain if you want to. Uh, anyone who wants to can also click this. Um, uh, what's it called? This link here. I'm going to put a put it into the chat so that anyone who wants to can follow along with what I'm doing in this part of the presentation. Let me go over here and type it into the chat to everyone. So feel free to click there if you want to explore what it is I'm doing. Um, if, you, uh, if you went and clicked uh, this details button that's in the top right corner of the page that has OpReturn, 
you would get to see this page, which contains information about what's inside the app return. It gives you more details. And in this case, it is 20 bytes of text, uh, which is this right here that starts with 6F and ends with FA. That is what the person who added this colored coin transaction into the blockchain added. That's where the colored coin is. Um, the line that says 6A dot 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 FA contains information about the transfer of a colored coin. In this case, they were the person who did this was transferring Tether. And I want to point out and highlight here that this transfer happened directly on Bitcoin's blockchain. I'm not looking at like the liquid blockchain or I'm not looking at the test net or I'm not looking at lightning. This is directly happening on Bitcoin's blockchain, a transfer of US dollar tether from one person to another by means of this piece of text right here. So let's get into what this, what's inside this piece of text or what, what it is if you know how to read it, like an Omni wallet would, would know how to read this. Um, this is the piece of text 6A over to FA and I've color coded it to represent the various pieces of, uh, of the transaction. Uh, 6A14 is a code that Omni wallets interpret to mean 20 bytes of data are incoming. Uh, and this is the, a really critical part, this 6F to 69 part, which is uh, the red part portion, is a prefix that goes on all Omni transactions. And when it's present, uh, you, it gets converted to the word Omni if you take it and convert that into alphanumeric characters like we usually, uh, like we usually read. So any Omni wallet that sees this 6F to 69 thing on the blockchain in an op return is like, hey, that's for me. At least th that's for somebody using an Omni wallet and I know how to read that. So they'll, they'll take all of, they'll, uh, Omni wallets scan the blockchain looking for op returns uh, in inside Bitcoin transactions, which have this prefix. And if they find it, then they say, let's, let's take a look. Uh, all other Bitcoin transactions, they ignore. They only pay attention to the ones that have this in them. So what's the next part? The purple part uh, is a, uh, it encodes a function called simple send. So this is something that Omni wallets just know um, if they see eight zeros in a row, they know that what that means is somebody is sending a token from one, from one person to another, uh, from the sender to the recipient. Uh, and they, put, they make that one eight zeros because it's the most common one and thus they give it the lowest value. Um, uh, there are other functions you can use with Omni. They've got lending functions and they've got um, uh, trading functions where you can make offers and, and stuff and those have other numbers on them. But when you when an Omni wallet sees eight zeros in a row in this this part of it, then they say, okay, somebody's sending a token from one person to another. Then they need to know what token is being sent. And that's what this green part do, uh, tells them. Uh, this green part encodes an identifier. Uh, and the most the most commonly used Omni token is US dollar tether. So that has the encoding 1F, which corresponds to the number 31 in uh, alphanumeric characters. It was the 31st token to be issued on Omni. And, um, and so they gave it the number 1F. If any wallet that sees a 1F thing knows that somebody's trying to transfer tethers, um, tether dollars. Then the last part is an amount. If you converted this into number into normal numerals, it would be the amount of 8,763 and some change. Um, so a little over uh, 80, 80, uh, $8,700. And that's what an Omni transaction looks like. Uh, so I want to point out here uh, that this is most of the information that an Omni wallet needs to know about uh, a transaction. But there are a couple of other things they need to know. And those are mentioned on this page. Uh, importantly, they need to know who the recipient is. And the recipient is not encoded in this information right here. Instead, the recipient, uh, going back to this screen, is um, this address right here address 13 all the way over to HB. Uh, and how does the Omni wallet know that this person is the recipient of the coins? Well, it's because of this output over here. This uh, output of 546 sats uh, is about the minimum that a legacy address can receive. And uh, if it sees one of those on there, then it knows the, per the reason this person received 546 sats is not because somebody was paying him for, I don't know, a stick of gum. It's because they were sending him Omni tokens and that's how you do it. You put an output that has 546 sats. And then this is the recipient. Um, because this is the recipient, you can actually send Omni tokens directly to a Bitcoin address. It, it doesn't have its own addressing scheme or anything. It's just a Bitcoin address. And that's how it knows who the recipient is. And then who's the sender? Well, the sender is the, the previous, the, the person who previously got the colored coin is the sender. And then he sends it along to, uh, to this guy. And then this guy will, he, if he wants to send it on later, he will use his own private key to publish a transaction with an op return sending it on to somebody else. And by this method, Omni wallets can trace the history of a bunch of, of, of a transfer of a token. 
they can trace it all the way back to when it was issued. Uh, and I want to mention this here. Um, so Omni nodes and wallets use the recipient address plus the transaction info. That's the color coded stuff I showed you earlier to determine all of this information. What's the ID of the token? How many were transferred? What address had them before? What address has them now? Now this part here, what address had them before is what makes uh, Omni tokens traceable, which is very important for Omni wallets. By knowing who had them before, they can look up the previous transaction, make sure everything checks out, and then uh, it, see who had them before that guy. And then they can look back again and see who had them before that guy and who had them before that guy. And it all traces back to uh, a valid issuer. So every Omni token has uh, somebody who is the only person authorized to issue that token. Um, so for example, with Tether, it's Tether Corporation. They have a Bitcoin address, which is on their website. And only if, a Bit if that Bitcoin address issues uh, this, uh, this text and signs it, only those are valid tethers, the ones that Tether Corporation promises if you, if you, um, if you use those tokens and uh, either uh, send them around, they'll, they'll like honor that. Like if you send them back to Tether, they'll give you real dollars in exchange for those. Um, so that's um, the valid issuance is, is a pretty important thing. And an Omni wallet uses this information, which tells you what address had the tokens before you, um, to trace it back and make sure that any, any token is only issued by a valid issuer. And only if it's issued by a valid issuer, do they consider it a valid transaction. They also use this, what address had them before stuff to check that there were no double spends. Cause it would be really bad if, you know, this guy before sending them to one, three, you know, HB over here, if he had previously sent them to somebody else, all $8,000, if he had previously sent them to someone else and then published this op return, uh, this guy's wallet needs to check and see, you know, does, does this guy have them at the time he made this transaction? Uh, otherwise, it would be susceptible to double spends. So the, the awareness of who had them before uh, allows it to do that. It can check the blockchain and make sure that that uh, public key or that address never sent those coins to somebody else because that would be on the blockchain. And since it's not on the blockchain, he knows that he still had them at the time when he sent this transaction. Okay, so that's the information you need to know. Uh, in order to understand how Omni, as well as uh, the other protocols I'll go through work. Uh, this is how colored coins work in general. Um, so before I move on, I just want to ask if anybody has any questions about uh, what colored coins are or what you can use them for or anything like that. Yeah, both of those uh, questions. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> run that by me again. <laughs> uh, both of the questions. Okay, yeah. Um, or I can uh, just keep. I can shut up because I'm too uh, naive for this level of uh, Bitcoin education. Yeah, this is very technical. <laughs> it is. Uh, I um, uh, I'm uh, stymied by the fact that I'm a developer and I only think in terms of codes and and stuff. So what can you use them for? Well, they're mostly used on Bitcoin for two things. Um, NFTs and stable coins. What are NFTs? NFTs are things that you can, are, are uh, pieces of text that encode information about an image, uh, typically an image. Sometimes it's a poem or um, uh, a piece of music or whatever, or, or some, some form of media. And by encoding N or by creating NFTs, when you issue them, you're, uh, what you typically do is you take a, an image uh, that you've created and you put information about it on Bitcoin's blockchain and then you transfer that information from one person to another. By means of this, you can sell art uh, on the blockchain. So that's what NFTs are for. They refer to non-fungible tokens, uh, meaning that uh, it's not, uh, fungibility would allow you to like treat one piece of, uh, one, one token is the same as another. Uh, this is what, what Bitcoin is supposed to be. If I give you a Bitcoin and then you give it to somebody else, they're not gonna be like, oh, uh, this Bitcoin isn't, is no good to me. Like uh, all, all Bitcoins are equal. Um, with art, it's not the same. If I send you a picture of the Mona Lisa, that is something, well, if, if I was the creator of the Mona Lisa and I sent you that, that would be a very unique thing that nobody else could, um, could do. And um, it's not the same as like a Picasso. You know, they're not, those things aren't interchangeable with one another. They're, they're different pieces of art. And so that's what non-fungible tokens are or NFTs is uh, when you send somebody a piece of data that is not interchangeable with other ones. Um, but you're transferring ownership of that, of that piece of data, which represents the piece of art uh, probably in the real world or 
uh, anymore. They're usually on the internet anyway. But uh, stable coins then are the other things that people use them for. And stable coins are um, uh, cryptocurrencies that have a one-to-one -one peg with the dollar. Uh, these are useful in, ex in exchanges. Many exchanges on the internet um, have the ability to transfer between Bitcoin and your local currency, but for some countries, they don't have access to uh, real dollars. Uh, and so they will use uh, these stable coins that are digital representations of that. Um, and that's what they're mainly used for is NFTs and stable coins. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, sorry. So you're saying colored coins are non-fungible. Is that what they are? Uh, some are. Uh, some of them are NFTs. Those ones are non-fungible. Some of them are stable coins. Stable coins are fungible. But colored coins in general are bits of data, just like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. And they're different from Bitcoin by the fact that... Uh, uh, well, uh, they're not bitcoins. Uh, so the the type of, the piece of data that is um, when bitcoins are issued, that that piece of text is issued by miners, and miners are the only ones who are allowed to issue new bitcoins. They're allowed to issue currently six point two five per block. Uh, and so th when you trace the history of a of the ownership of the piece of text that is a bitcoin, it always goes back to a miner. And if it does go back to a miner, and that miner that miner's block follows all the rules, then your wallet knows that's a valid bitcoin. Um, uh, NFTs and stablecoins are not issued by a miner. They are issued by um, corporations and artists, typically. And so when, in order to assess the validity of that piece of text, uh, you, your wallet traces it back to the, uh, to the artist who issued it or the uh, corporation that issued it. And if, as long as it's that corporation or artist, then it says, okay, this is you know, an NFT or this is a stablecoin. Whereas if it traced back to a miner, then they would say, okay, this is a Bitcoin. Does that so make sense? So a colored coin is an NFT or uh, the other thing you said? Or a stable or, coin. Or a yeah. stable coin. And you would use them as an NFT or a stable coin. Correct. So I guess I'm wondering the term colored coin corrals certain variety of NFT or stable coins by what criteria? Uh, so st solely and only by the criteria of who issued them. So all, only... colored, all colored coins must be issued by only a certain source. Um, well, anyone can issue them, but a, a wallet will only treat it as a valid um, stablecoin, for example, if it's issued by a stablecoin corporation, such as Tether or USDC or one of these other ones. Okay. Now, I guess if, the important thing to know at any money. rate is what is the advantage of colored coins? Um, the, well, uh, that's a good question, and I get to that in a, in a few oh, slides. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. I, I thought you may have covered it right. Sorry. Nope, that's coming. So thank you for the, that question. Are there any others? Okay. Yeah. Our oh, NFT there's... is the, uh, the investment that I go on fidelity.com and purchase, or is that different? Uh, it's probably different. If you if you went on Fidelity and purchased artwork, it may have been an NFT. If not, it probably wasn't. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing what the what the what the function and purpose of having colored colored coins is. So I'll let you go. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions at this point? Um, I just want to add. I am adding in the chat several links for what omni is the bitcoin wallet and this protocol software um also counterparty um and what rare pepes are so if you look in the chat you will see um inside uh the various links to those but that's that's all that i had thank you yep and i'll cover a couple of those in uh, in just a bit Oh, we've Perfect. gone pretty in depth on how Omni works, though, and that is, um, they all work basically the same way. Um, so I'll get into this. Yeah, we'll keep going. So now I want to talk about the history of colored coins. And uh, they first, the first time that I've been able to find a reference to something equivalent to them was in 2011. Back in 2011, there was a Bitcoin developer named Mike Hearn, and he described a way to encode um, the ownership and transfer of assets other than Bitcoin uh, using Bitcoin's blockchain. Uh, now he was not, he did not know that he invented, um, or if, if he is the inventor, um, he's just the earliest person I could find to talk about this. He did not seem to know that he invented um, 
uh, colored coins at the time. What he thought he was talking about was real world assets, like um, like a car or a house. What he wanted to do was he wanted to put text on the blockchain that uh, represents the ownership of that house. And then you could transfer it from Bitcoin address to Bitcoin address. And you would install some kind of uh, device inside the car or inside the house where it would only unlock for, for the person who owns the Bitcoin address that currently owns that piece of text. Uh, and that was his one of his ideas for how you could transfer like a house or a car on the blockchain. And then you would unlock it and turn it on uh, using your Bitcoin wallet. Uh, no one's ever really done that as far as I'm aware. But uh, the idea of transferring text around other than uh, text that's not Bitcoins, but represents other things. Um, pe some people took that and, and decided, hey, it doesn't have to be a physical object. It doesn't have to represent a physical object. It can re represent digital things too. And then uh, from that, uh, from that discovery, colored coins were born. Uh, so J.R. Willett invented the Omni protocol that I just showed you an example of an Omni transaction. Uh, at the time they were called master coins and he invented those in 2012. The same year, another guy released a, a general white paper on how you could do colored coins. Um, when Omni came out, it was um, controversial because uh, they did something called an ICO. In fact, they were the first company to do an ICO. What's a, an ICO? Well, it's a way of taking people's Bitcoins by promising them uh, hey, if you send me one Bitcoin, I will send you 150 of this uh, of these coins I just invented. Uh, in this case, it was these master coins. Uh, and that was kind of uh, looked upon as, or frowned upon at the time um, because it was like the people who got those didn't didn't uh, do anything to earn them and they weren't worth anything yet. They, he issued them in the hopes that they would go up in value later. And uh, some people thought that was pretty scammy uh, way of getting people's Bitcoins. So uh, in 2014, uh, a guy named Robbie Dermody launched a, a, a clone, basically, of Omni called Counterparty, which was the exact same thing, but without the ICO. So it's, I say the exact same thing, and I mean like the protocol's the same, the wallets look the same, um, everything about it that I can see, they, they look identical. But this one was called Counterparty, and it didn't have an ICO. And so then that, that was another option for using uh, colored coins. In 2014, um, the company called Tether launched their stablecoin and they issued it on Bitcoin using the name Realcoin. Later, they renamed it to Tether. Uh, in 2015, there was a trading card company called Spells of Genesis who put the first, uh, at least that I'm aware of, they were the first NFTs on Bitcoin. I imagine that probably during these four years of development, somebody else had probably done it first, but these are the first ones I was able to find were these Spells of Genesis trading cards. And they used the, uh, them with Counterparty. So um, I want to mention that Counterparty and Omni both still exist today. And Counterparty is more frequently used for NFTs. And Omni is more frequently used for stable coins. Um, like I said, there's no real difference between them. Uh, either one can do both. Like Omni can do stable coins and NFTs. Counterparty can do stable coins and NFTs. But for some reason, people tend to use Counterparty more for NFTs and Omni more for stable coins. I'm not sure why. Uh, in 2016, there was a, 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 a the most popular uh, Bitcoin-based NFT is called Rare Pepe's, and they were created in 2016 uh, using Counterparty. Uh, in October of that year, a de Bitcoin developer named Peter Todd proposed a new method of doing um, uh, stable coins and, and colored coins and NFTs using something called client-side validation. And I will I happen to use this in something that I made, so I will show it later but it's potentially a more private way to issue and transfer assets on Bitcoin. Uh, that same year at the presentation when Peter Todd uh, proposed this thing, which was at Scaling Bitcoin in uh, a conference that was held in 2016, one of the people who was in, in attendance was named Giacomo Zucco and he heard about this um, client side validation scheme and he decided that he was gonna uh, implement it. And he uh, has created this project called RGB, stands for red, green, blue, um, cause that's the colors uh, goes with colored coin and it, it uses this new client side validation thing, which is different from how Omni and counterparty do it. Um, in 2019, a guy named Maxim Orlovsky started working on uh, RGB and they're uh, getting ready to release it. They think that they'll be able to, they'll be releasing this, um, new, this new, um, uh, colored coin protocol in, in November of this year, which I'm really excited about. One difference with theirs is it works on uh, it, it works natively on Lightning, which is really cool. 
So I'm, or at least it should work when it gets released later this year. Uh, I've been following their project since 2019. And at some point I got frustrated because I couldn't get it to work, like following along on their GitHub and trying to compile it and make it, make it run. Max has been there with me as I tried to do that a few different days. I couldn't figure it out and it never worked for me. So I got annoyed and decided to make my own thing using the same uh, protocol that Peter Todd proposed back in 2016. And I call mine SigChain, which I might demo for you later. But uh, at, the, at their last developer call, the RGB folks said that they're going to be releasing in November. And so what I've been working on is uh, worse than what they're doing. So but probably a moot point. You could just wait for what they're doing. Um, now, somebody asked me about the benefits of um, colored coins. And that's what this slide is about. Um, the benefit of using those uh, is that they are just as secure as Bitcoin because they use Bitcoin's blockchain for every transaction. Um, before colored coins existed, the main way that people would introduce um, new coins was by creating a new blockchain. And block all blockchains are not created equal. Uh, in order to be secure, it needs to have many thousands of people running the software, uh, independent developers uh, who are paying attention to it and writing code and doing bug reviews and, and making sure it's all safe. And Bitcoin's is the biggest and the best. Um, so you, reusing Bitcoin's blockchain makes it more makes it more secure than if you like spun up your own blockchain and then uh, only had a few people working on it. Whereas Bitcoin's got you know, many thousands of developers all over the world making stuff for it. Uh, also, they uh, run at the same speed as Bitcoin, which is about 10 minutes per confirmation. I put that as a benefit. In terms of like international transfers and stuff, that that's, was never heard of before. And there were lots of experiments with doing remittances using um, stable coins that were created using the Omni protocol because it's so much faster than uh, like Western Union where you have to wait three and a half days uh, and fees are like on those platforms are like 20% 20, um, 20 of the value of the transaction often. So these things were much cheaper and much faster in those terms. I also put the exact same sentence as a drawback. Omni and Counterparty run at the same speed as Bitcoin, 10 minutes per confirmation. Um, because as anyone who like me has tried to use Bitcoin or uh, any of these other things in like a coffee shop, uh, standing there waiting around for 10 minutes, hoping that it confirms soon is no fun. Um, so that's also a drawback. Uh, for, yeah. Um, transactions cost about twice as much as a Bitcoin transaction, mostly because of the dust transaction. If I can go back to this slide back here, this is the dust transaction. With, with that, uh, what I say dust is um, a, a very small value like this, 546 sats. Um, it, it costs like 300 sats in order to move a legacy, uh, move Bitcoins out of a legacy address. And so when you put a very tiny amount in an address like this, there's no point in bringing it out again because you're gonna spend the, almost the same amount um, in fees just to move it as you would be to just leave it there. So those are sometimes called dust transaction, meaning me, transactions, meaning they're very small. And in Omni, you have to put these things in the transaction, uh, which costs money. Like it costs 546 cents. It's like 25 cents right now, uh, which that's not even like, so in addition to the fee you pay for the whole transaction, you also have to pay 25 cents in order to just put this address on here that represents the recipient. Um, so yeah, that's a, a drawback is that they're more expensive. Um, um, any questions about the benefits and drawbacks of using these things? Um, I am answering a question from Val in the uh, chat um, and I'll just, I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, Val asks, are you saying it's dangerous to use any, any blockchain other than Bitcoin? I answered, in my personal opinion, uh, yes, but of course it's subjected to any other any other person's uh, opinion uh, for value. But in short, the reason why I would I would consider that why you would want to put you know certain tokenized assets on Bitcoin if you so chose versus any other chain is because it has the most security, it has the most hash power and the most computational energy behind it. Um, it's easier to destroy. Uh, a non-fungible token on a different blockchain rather than Bitcoin because you would have to go and rewrite the Bitcoin blockchain itself, which is tremendously more challenging than another you know, blockchain that was just spun up. So I hope that answered your uh, question, Val. Uh, the, the thing, go, go ahead. Sorry, one more question in regards to that. So uh, Ethereum and ADA, Cordona, they're on different blockchains? Yes, those are different blockchains. 
So are they less um, secure than Bitcoin then in that case, or in your opinion, or? Uh, yeah, they're, they're less secure, um, but it depends on what you're, what you're, what amounts you're transacting in. So um, it, what, what blockchains are designed to guard against is, are, is transaction rollbacks, where you, where you send somebody a Bitcoin or, or whatever token, and then you know, they, their wallet says they've received it, and then uh, somehow you roll back the blockchain by one block, and then now they don't have it anymore. But but you've got your product. You know you've run out the door, and and uh, uh, and then their wallet says, "Oh, error! You had the the asset, but now you don't anymore." Um, so that's what blockchains are designed to guard against. And um, in order to do a transaction rollback, um, you have to roll back a, a a block on the blockchain, which uh, the the um, the cost to do it is the total cost of all the transactions that are in that block. Now on, on Bitcoin, a block is worth about, or each block is worth somewhere in the order of $75,000. And so doing a rollback on Bitcoin costs $75,000. And thus Bitcoin is only safe for, uh, at least if you're, uh, if, if you're buying something um, uh, that in a store or whatever, and it, it costs $75,000, if you're the merchant, don't accept just one confirmation. Don't accept just one. Uh, it, it got into a Bitcoin block and your wallet says you've received it. Don't accept that yet. Wait more, wait longer. The more blocks you wait for to come in, the more it costs to roll back that transaction. Um, so Bitcoin is safe for up to $75,000. And then if you wait longer, then it gets safer for long, for bigger amounts. Other blockchains are not. Um, Ethereum has about 25% of the capacity of Bitcoin. So if Ethereum would be safe for transactions up to around $18,000. And ADA is much, much less than that. It's about 5% of Bitcoin's transaction hash rate. So or uh, Bitcoin's uh, minor hash rate. And so those that one is only safe for, uh, if you're in a store, only safe for up to like $2,000. Um, what about, what about just all putting all these, your money into it? Just putting, like I put my money into Ethereum and ADA. Rada. Oh yeah. So just it's keeping just, just it there. Your money into it, it's not gonna. It's not gonna get lost. So and nothing's gonna happen. Okay. And then, and does anybody out there invest in Ethereum and Cardano? I'm just wondering, or Rada, I should say. Is. Uh, I don't. No. I think my. Um, yeah, I do. I've got Cardano. You got Cardano? Okay. Yeah, I've got some Theta too. Okay, I'm not too. I'm not too familiar with that one, to be honest. But uh, okay, I'm going okay. to move on and uh, unless there are other questions about the benefits and drawbacks of colored coins. Okay. Uh, another method of doing stable coins and NFTs is using side chains. There are currently two major examples of side chains. One of them is called liquid and one of them is called rootstock. Uh, so what is a side chain? It is uh, another blockchain uh, which doesn't have its own token, but um, so that there's no like a, a, a blockchain that doesn't have like Ethereum on it or doesn't have ADA or these other things, um, but has like a clone of Bitcoin. Um, uh, so uh, you, what these things exist, and I'll describe them a, bit, a few paragraphs from now, uh, a bit more. But one way to issue stable coins and NFTs is to send Bitcoins to a side chain and then issue the stable coins or NFTs there. Most of these side chains, I. Um, they have all the same functions that Bitcoin does. Some of them have more functions. And so if you use them, you can do, um, you can also do stable coins and NFTs on those. Why you would do that is that um, side chains tend to be faster and cheaper to use than Bitcoin um, due to having fewer users, uh, fewer transactions that need processed means that there's a, a, a smaller line in order to get into a block. And uh, so you have to pay less to get into it because there's just more abundant block space and, and less, of, um, less of demand for it. Uh, so the, consequently, the costs go down of using them. Um, they have a downside, though. They, since they don't have their own native token with its own value, um, they have to come up with some way to peg the value of these side chains um, to big Bitcoin. And usually it doesn't work perfectly. Usually the value of the tokens on them are a bit higher or lower than Bitcoin, causing slippage when you try to go and use them or try to get back out of them. And also you have to trust a federation to hold your Bitcoins while you use the side chain. So the way most of these things work, uh, it, all of the ones that I'm aware of, uh, you send Bitcoins to a small group of people called a federation, and the federation uh, creates for you on their side chain an equivalent amount of Bitcoins, or of uh, not Bitcoins, but of side chain coins. Um, 
So like if I sent, if I wanted to put 50 Bitcoins onto one of these side chains, I need to send 50 Bitcoins to this uh, federation. And then the federation would create 50 side chain Bitcoins on their side chain for me. And they would send it to my side chain address. Then you can use those side chain Bitcoins uh, on the side chain for as long as you want. And when you're done, you um, usually burn them signaling that you're done with uh, using the side chain. And when you've, however many you burn, um, that's how many Bitcoins they send back to you. Uh, the federation sends back to you on the real blockchain. Um, so that's how side chains work. And so far, I don't, I'm not aware of anybody complaining that, that they don't uh, work. Some people do complain about the slippage that occurs when you, when you move coins to and from them. Um, but to me, I don't, I don't like the idea of giving my coins to a small group of people and then hoping they give them back to me later. Um, and that's how most of these side chain things work. So uh, I've tried to come up with a, um, what, what I'm about to go into is my own invention in the colored coins space, which is uh, different, very similar to how Omni and Counterparty work, but also, um, oh, what's it called? Um, uh, different. <laughs> it, it inherits some properties from these side chains. Uh, before I do, there's something I forgot to do, which is to show you all Scarce.City. Scarce.City uh, is something that I was supposed to show you back when I was talking about Counterparty. Um, and I was talking about NFTs and how you can buy and sell artwork on the blockchain. Scarce.city is a website where you can do that. And if you create art, you can put it on this website and buy and sell it for, uh, for Bitcoin. If you click the little green frog up here, this is where you can buy, sell, and trade rare Pepe's, which I talked about earlier, a meme NFT um, artwork. These look like cards, and some of them are being sold for uh, thousands of dollars, like 0.6 Bitcoin is like uh, $30,000 or something, 30 and somewhere around there. Uh, and you can buy this ugly picture of a green man for $30,000 if you want to. And then it'll be in your Bitcoin wallet instead of his. Um, and you can do that with all of these things. So some people like this. Um, I don't know why they'd like it. I think it's ridiculous. But um, this is when I speak of sell, buying and selling NFTs using Counterparty. This is what I'm talking about. There are people who go around and uh, I'm sure they're very happy when they create this artwork in uh, half an hour on Microsoft Paint and then somebody pays, you know, what's that, around uh, $25 for it in Bitcoins for their weird green picture. Um, yeah, but uh, if anyone's interested, this is one of the websites where you can do that. And that's all I wanted to mention about, uh, about that. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions about uh, weird green men and why they're why people buy and sell these for ridiculous amounts of money? I take it those are example of non fungible tokens. Yes, these are examples of non fungible tokens. This is what non fungible tokens look like. And when they're wrapped up with the Bitcoin blockchain thing, then they become a colored coin. Correct. Or a, okay, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about this uh, this stuff? Um, I just want to emphasize what Duck said in the chat. Just pay attention to how many are issued as well. So there's not like a cap um, on the amount of rare Pepe's that can be created. While there is, you know, the amount per, you know, that is there, you know, one and, you know, one and a half thousand issued for there, 3,000 are issued. Um, you know, uh, of course, you still have to, and that's, that's what somebody asked in the very beginning of this. Um, essentially, who am I trusting here? And you are trusting... The, the creator of this to make sure that they have um, they have that lock on the supply cap. So um, the creator can always go and either make more. Well, you're also you're also way. trusting that after you're also trusting that after you've bought it for you know twenty thousand dollars or whatever that somebody else will buy it later for twenty thousand dollars because they they probably won't. But some people get lucky. Um, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions about NFTs before I move on? I apologize for doing that section out of order. I was supposed to show this back when I was talking about Counterparty and I forgot to. Okay, so moving on, I wanna talk about SIG chains. This is my invention and uh, it is not as cool as it would have been if RGB wasn't coming out in a few days, but uh, since RGB is coming out, 
these are kind of a moot point. But these are my invention. They are a hybrid between what Omni does and what Liquid does. And uh, it is similar to Liquid in that it does have a side chain, but it doesn't have a pegged token, uh, which makes it more similar to Omni or Counterparty. A pegged token meaning one of those things that is roughly the same value as a Bitcoin. It doesn't, my invention doesn't have anything like that. Uh, SigChain users can create transactions in one of two ways. One way is just the same way Omni does it. And the other way is uh, similar to how Liquid does it. Uh, if you do it the Omni-like way, then you create, you, create a, uh, some, you create a transaction, you take a hash of it, um, which is a, like a thumbprint of that data, and you put that uh, thumbprint on Bitcoin's blockchain in an op return. And nodes on my, on my network scan Bitcoin's blockchain for these things, just like how Omni does. And then uh, on mine, they, they extract them from Bitcoin's blockchain, blockchain and put them on uh, this other blockchain that I invented called SigChain. Um, if you use the liquid-like way, then you send a hash of your transactions data to a trusted signer. Um, by a trusted signer, I mean he's somebody who's going to co-sign your transaction. Every Bitcoin transaction has to be signed by your wallet. If you use SigChain, it, also, it gets co-signed by this other person. And then all the SigChain nodes um, trust that signer's signature to say this, this person doesn't have to pay to put uh, the, this transaction on Bitcoin's blockchain. If it's signed by this trusted signer, then we'll just accept it regardless. Uh, and so you have that option of using that person instead of putting it on the blockchain. You can just get it signed by him and then all the nodes trust that signature. Um, what's the benefit of doing things in the, in the way where you are using a trusted signer? Well, the nice thing about um, having people sign your stuff for you is that uh, people can sign stuff really fast and cheaply. It takes like, 30 seconds to send somebody a piece of text and ask them to sign it with their wallet. And you can automate that and it's really fast. Plus that allows us to do stuff on Lightning. On the Lightning Network, you can charge a fee for providing signatures for things. And um, that's really cool because you can uh, make the trusted signer who's probably gonna be me wealthy. So if you wanna make me wealthy, you can use my SigChain thing, but uh, no one will ever use it because uh, there's no point. Um, a drawback is that if, a trust, if the trusted party stops providing his or her signing service, uh, you can't use them anymore, and instead you can fall back on putting your transactions on the blockchain like everybody else does. Um, and by using this method, the SigChain network can uh, use the trusted signer for as long as he's available and have fast and cheap transactions. But if he ever goes away and runs off, um, at least you can still use the thing. It just becomes about as uh, slow and expensive as regular Bitcoin is. Um, what are the benefits of doing it in the Omni-like way? Well, uh, it, that makes it more secure and robust. You're not relying on somebody to stick around, which is nice. Um, and it also, because it has this the way of uh, the alternative way of using it, um, you can keep on you can keep on using it if the um, if the trusted third party uh, me ever runs away. Um, my proposal also improves on Omni by committing to the recipient's address in the transaction hash rather than using a dust output. If you remember the uh, Omni transactions and counterparty transactions cost slightly more than or about twice as much as a regular Bitcoin transaction because of the dust output. Mine doesn't have those, so they're about 25 cents cheaper, which is not that much of a, not that big of a difference. Uh, a drawback is that um, my, if you use this Omni-like way, it's no faster or cheaper than regular Bitcoin transactions. Um, it might not be much more expensive, but it's no better either. So my, my suggestion, if, any, if I ever build this, is for people to use me as the signer whenever they can and then only use the alternative way if I ever run off, um, which I'm liable to do because I get bored with things. <laughs> um, SigChain transactions are similar to Omni transactions, and this is an example of one. I color-coded it just like I did the Omni transaction earlier. Um, but before I show you this, before I go further into this color-coded portion, I want to ask if anyone has any questions about uh, liquid and rootstock and side chains in general. Uh, I only have this one slide about them, but uh, some people might have questions about that. Any questions? Yeah, I got one. Um, so if people were incentivized to use the like side chain, I guess, version of sick chain, uh, w would you be able to use like the federation to be trusted signer so you wouldn't have to rely on one trusted third party or yes you could yeah. uh except uh, the reason i didn't design it that way is because i don't know how to do federations uh i only know how to do a single signer uh as a programmer i'm just not competent enough 
So I'm making it with a single signer, uh, which is me. And then if somebody wants to come along and improve it later and make it a federation, that would be great because then it would be safer. Um, but yeah, I don't know how to do that. So I made it the way I know how to do. Gotcha, thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions about um, side chains, including SIG chain? Okay, I will keep going with the color coded stuff then. So this is what a SIG chain transaction looks like. I mentioned earlier that um, uh, that it's color coded, and uh, I realized when I was making or after I made this slide that the colors I used are red, uh, green, and blue, uh, or RGB, which are also the colors that RGB uses. And I didn't realize I was using uh, the colors of another um, protocol, but whatever that happened. Um, so the blue part is a sig chain address. Uh, it's the it start the all sig chain addresses start with zero zero, and that's what they look like. They're just random numbers and letters. In, uh, in a row. Um, this happens to be the sender's address. The person in blue here is sending sig, sig chain tokens to somebody else. Um, the red part is a hash of a transaction. A hash is a digital thumbprint of something. In this case, uh, this is a digital thumbprint of this. So they're color coded to look like one another. Um, but in here, you have some information about the transfer. You're, uh, so this guy, the guy in blue, is sending tokens to this guy. Uh, the name of the token is this mass over here, 9E07 dot 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 9530. That's the name of the token he's sent, created and sending. Um, he is issuing it in this transaction, and he's sending uh, 500 of them. And then there's this field over here called a nonce, which is just a random number that helps you make sure that the uh, first two numbers end up starting with 00. zero. Um, and then there's a signature, uh, which is in green. And the signature proves that the person who owns this public key also signed this message and committed to it on the SIG chain, which is important for ensuring that there's no double spends or any nastiness like that. So that's is what a SIG chain transaction looks like. Um, the the benefits of using these, excuse me, the benefits of using these rather than um, the other things that I mentioned, um, counterparty and um, omni and uh, side chains or other side chains, I should say. The benefit is that. Uh, these things are very private. Uh, SigChain nodes, the information that they see is the sender's address. They see a, a hash, but they don't, they don't see what's inside it. So uh, let me go back to this slide. They see this. SigChain nodes see this piece in red, but they don't see this. And this information is the more important part. This tells you who the recipient is, how many coins they received, what the name of the coin they received is. Um, and th that's all very important information. So it's um, uh, sensitive information. And keeping that from being known to the network nodes is a good thing. So it's more private because it hides that data. Um, but it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't see the amount sent, the recipient's address, or the ID of the tokens being transferred. That data has to be given to the recipient separately. And you would like send them an email and say, hey, I sent you some tokens. Here's what I, here's the data. And then they could import that data into their wallet and uh, they'd be happy because they would have, because their wallet would show them that they received money. The recipient's wallet uses the transaction data that you send him meaning this part, they use this, um, plus the signed hash on the SIG chain, which is this part, blue, red, and green part. They use those pieces of data to decipher the same things that Omni needs, which is the ID of the token, how many were transferred, what address had them before, and what address has them now. Uh, and they use this property that they can tell who had them before uh, to make sure that there were no prior transfers to somebody else before they got to you. And uh, those would be a double spend. And they also make sure they go back to a valid issuer. Uh, so all the rest, after this part, it's all the same as Omni. The only real difference is that you also have the option of using a side chain um, to put them uh, on the SIG chain, which is then cheaper and faster. Um, so in conclusion, colored coins are the primary way to issue and transfer stable coins and NFTs on Bitcoin. Omni and Counterparty are the most secure and robust ways to do this, uh, at least that currently exist, but they are also often very slow and expensive. Uh, a major alternative is a side chain, and side chains are cool because they're faster and, uh, and cheaper than using uh, Omni or Counterparty, but they also have trusted third parties, and that federation could get corrupt or it could be pressured to shut down or stuff like that. So I made a hybrid that allows you to use it the same way you can use Omni and Counterparty, but also has this side chain thing, and if you, uh, as long as the side chain is available, you can use that, or if it ever goes away, you can go back to using it the way Omni and Counterparty work. 
uh, and these are some endnotes. Um, so I also have a demo of my SigChain software that I can show, but uh, this is another good time for questions. So does anybody have any questions about this stuff, about anything in the presentation or anything else? Thank you for uh, doing the presentation, though. It was really, really good. I know it was the first rough draft that you had out, uh, but for what information was provided, I hope people can at least grasp just the basic understanding of what the uh, workflow is of how it's identifiable on chain and why it's beneficial on Bitcoin versus another uh, blockchain. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Colin, but go ahead, man. Yeah, um, I was curious. I know, I know you said uh, like RGB is coming out, and people probably prefer to use that. But like, what I guess, what's the uh, what's the main difference? Are they doing a hybrid approach like this too, or are they doing something completely different for their version of colored coins? They are using client side validation, um, which is the property whereby um, the only information that um, uh, the the, the people people who aren't part of the transaction don't get to see any significant information, uh, meaning they don't get to see this stuff. Only the person who is uh, receiving the two coins sees what information sees this information, um, and so they use that property, which is new. Uh, Omni and Counterparty don't do that, and it's pretty cool because it makes everything more private. Um, so that's the main benefit of uh, RGB. And also, well, I, that is one of two big benefits. The other big benefit is that RGB works on Lightning. Um, and uh, Omni and Counterparty don't, or well, Omni possibly does. There's there is a chi there's some Chinese developers who um, claim to have written software that lets Omni work on Lightning, but I haven't been able to figure out how to run it yet because it's, all the documentation is in Chinese. Um, but maybe that that one might also Omni might also work on Lightning now, but RGB is expected to work on Lightning in November and when it gets released, and that'll be really cool because then we'll be able to do all this stuff at lightning speed. So. Gotcha. Yeah, I definitely noticed the uh, the privacy part of this is is pretty cool. Do you know? Um, is this is that similar to like how confidential transactions work on Liquid, or is that a completely different thing? Uh, it it is a completely different implementation of how to get, achieve privacy, and um, one of the in, in the way that Liquid does uh, confidential transactions. Uh, you can see who the sender and the recipient are, but you can't see the amount of the tokens or the um, or what token was sent. Um, so you don't know on there if somebody's sending bitcoins or if they're sending dollars or if they're sending something else, uh, like an NFT. Uh, yeah, that, so, that, yeah. So I guess the, the reason why I was asking that, um, not so much for like the liquid side, but just for this idea of client client side validation. Can you explain one more time? Um, cause it, it is pretty confusing. Like if you're not able to see kind of all the details on what happened in a transaction, how can you verify it? Like, I don't, I don't know if I was thinking maybe an example of like preventing a double spend. Like yeah. if someone tried to do that, like how the client would actually know that they tried to double spend and then, you know, unvalidate that transaction. Yeah, I can, I, don't know if that would be I can show you that when I do my demo or if I do my demo, I'm not okay. sure if I'll have enough time now. But um, if I don't have enough time, then I will try to explain it in words. But I think it would be easier to explain by showing how it works. Definitely. Um, cool. So let me see if anyone else has any questions. And if we still have enough time, then I will get, get to that in the demo. Otherwise, I'll try to answer it with words. A any other questions before, before that? Uh, I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, so I think I, I heard that. Um, smart contracts on the lightning network eventually can you can denominate channels in in usd so you essentially have like stable coin and a lightning channel that's yes, collateralized that is, by bitcoin that is one of the things that the rgb folks are trying to accomplish uh, and i think so are the people who are making omni in the the, the chinese developers who are working on that uh, omni lightning project um, they are, they're all trying, both of those teams are trying to create a situation where you can have dollars in a, a lightning channel and send dollars over the lightning network. Uh, if you want a, a preview of this, there is a, a company who is um, doing something that is, that feels very similar, and that's called Strike. If you, if any of you have a, have the Bitcoin wallet called Strike, um, 
their Twitter handle is uh, LN strike, the letter L, the letter N, and then the word strike. And they are doing something where uh, they hold tethers in a, um, in a Bitcoin address and they allocate them to the, to their users when, whenever you receive a Bitcoin transaction. Uh, which they, they also support Lightning. So like, let's say you receive $50 on the Lightning Network into their into your LN Strike wallet. Uh, what shows up there is 50 US dollars and they don't show you that you've received any Bitcoins. They just show you, they allocate to you the 50, 50 of the dollars that are in their Bitcoin address um, using US dollar tether. And so then you can, uh, your value stays stable. It remains $50 for the duration of time that it's in their wallet. It doesn't fluctuate with the price of Bitcoin. Um, and then if you send it out later, it goes to the next person. Uh, if they have a strike wallet, it'll come to them as dollars. Or, or if they don't have a strike wallet, if they have a regular Bitcoin wallet, then it'll show up as regular Bitcoins. Um, and that's kind of a cool thing that that is something that already works and you can use that uh, today. But um, and that's what hopefully RGB and Omnibolt will feel like. But the difference is you won't have to have an account with anyone to use them on RGB and Omni. Um, you will need you'll just download a wallet and start using it without needing to register or anything, um, which is pretty cool. With LN Strike, you have to like get an account on their website and give them your ID and stuff like that. So. And Omni is, uh, is what these colored coins are or? Omni is one, pro one colored coin protocol. Uh, it is the main one that is used for stable coins. Okay, yeah, that was, gonna, that was my question is, is whether or not you, you could, uh, instead of get Tether, instead of having Tether um, issue stable coins for colored coins, you could instead remove the counterparty risk of Tether and replace that with collateralized stable coin as um, colored Bitcoin. There are, there are some projects that are trying to do that, but not, as far as I've seen, not in the colored coin space. I have not seen anyone trying to do collateralized um, uh, debt-based stable coins in the uh, colored coin space. I've seen it in other, in other projects, but um, perhaps I will present on them some other time. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, if you want to look into that, uh, one company to look into is SuredBits, S-U-R-E-D-B-I-T-S. They are trying to do that in one of their projects, so you can look into them. But they're, they're, they're not doing it with colored coins. They're doing it in a different way. Any other questions before I hopefully uh, see if I have time for the demo? Uh, see it, DC. I know you just popped in. Um, I threw in the chat the various links above DC's message that was covered uh, in here. The example of the tokens, the wallets, Omni and Counterparty, uh, Rare Pepe's, uh, and then the side chains uh, also that were in there. Um, we did not discuss, uh, not, not so much in detail, but um, only one of them. Uh, the uh, Some of the uh, Bitcoin NFT marketplaces, we did cover one, scarcity, scarce.city, or yeah, scarce.city. Uh, and the other one, it, there's, a, there's a third one, I can't remember the name. There is also one uh, called Rare Toshi, raretoshi.com. And this one actually uses the liquid side chain. So you actually need to get liquid Bitcoin first to go and purchase or therefore issue your uh, non-fungible tokens or tether or stable coins, what have you, um, on the liquid. The other chain. one you might be thinking is CoinOS. CoinOS is another one, one where you can buy and sell NFTs, um, and they um, they are also using liquid. Yeah, thank you for CoinOS. And no, there's a fourth one then that I'm thinking of. I, it's it's like um uh I, I they just put out I just saw a tweet, not not two hours ago before we started this. I can't remember what it is, but I, what, if when I find it, I'll throw it in there. But CoinOS is also another one. I will put that in the link um, as well. Oh, I, I do. Me personally, I do have a really quick question on the issue with RGB being transferred through lightning what barriers and I'm, no, no i'm sorry not what barriers what software is needed in order for you to go and actually do something like that um i know they have the my citadel wallet and 
uh, something else from the LMD BP state yeah, association. I think, I think their plan is that the first um, the first wallet that'll be that they will release. Well, I guess they're going to release two wallets simultaneously. They're going to release the RGB node, which has a built-in wallet, and they're going to release my Citadel, which is an iOS uh, wallet. And so those are the two initial things. Uh, if you have either one of those, you'll be able to use RGB. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's a preview on iOS test flight for my Citadel wallet, actually right now, that you can, if, you're, uh, if you wanna be reckless and try out experimental software before it's released, you can go on uh, Apple's test flight program and use it. But um, I, I think it'd be hard to use it though, because you have to like know how to issue a token in order to in order to use it, which is hard to do, hard to do for most of us who aren't developers. Um, yeah, I oh. have used the my Citadel wallet. I just have not actually issued anything via RGB. Um, I know on yeah. the Block Explorer, it's I think we're up to what six total assets globally, or so. Yeah, and uh, hopefully that'll uh, explode, and we'll see some actually really useful stuff. Uh, in November. I'm super excited, by the way, that, they, that they're releasing in November. I've been waiting for them to release for two years. So yeah, we've been okay. waiting. We've been waiting for so, so long. And we've been on so many developer calls, you know, well, let me get to my demo, because I think that'll be the best way to answer uh, um, Chris. Was it Chris's question? The guy whose name starts with a C. Colin, Colin, Colin. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I'm not a front end developer, but this is my attempt to create a little wallet. Uh, that is for a SIG chain. Can everyone see something that looks like a black and white wallet on their screens? Yeah, yeah I can see it. I can. Okay, so the send button doesn't work. If I click it, it doesn't do anything. So this is this is all still very much a work in progress. But there are two buttons that uh, do work, which are issue tokens and import tokens. And right now, when you issue them, you also have to send them to somebody. So sending kind of works, but you just have to do it when you issue it. So this is all half working right now. Um, this is the ad. This is a SigChain address that comes with your wallet. I'm going to pull up another wallet over here, so that I have two running at the same time. Um, let me make this one smaller, and this one I will move over here. And there we go. So two wallets here, and I'm going to issue a token in one of them. This wants to know who you're going to send it to, so I will send it to the other one. Put it in there. Um, this is the from address. This is my own uh, SigChain address. Uh, the token I am creating is given a random identifying number it, or number slash numeric, alphanumeric key. Uh, and this identifies that token on the SigChain network. And then you have to type in an amount that you want to issue. I will issue 500 of this. I could also choose an image if I wanted to make this an NFT. And if it was an NFT, I would only issue one of them because uh, that would be fair. I would want to only make one copy of my artwork, but not doing an NFT because the image thing doesn't work and it causes it to crash. So I'm still working on that. Uh, but now when you click create transaction, it comes up with a screen. And on here you get uh, the JSON file, which you need to send to the recipient. And you would send this to him such as in an email. Um, and on his screen, he would need to import this into his wallet. And nothing's gone on the blockchain. There's no protection from double spends yet. I will show you how we do how we protect from double spends in a moment. But when, in fact, it'll happen when this guy clicks import. If he clicks import, uh, what it's going to say is you need a signature, and you need to you need some other stuff. But I'm going to show you how to get a signature first. So how you get a signature is this guy's going to have to commit to this transaction on Bitcoin's blockchain, and when he does, a signature is going to go on Bitcoin's blockchain, which um, validates that this is. Uh, that this data is, well, it's on the blockchain. So I'm gonna do that now. I've already funded this wallet with some Bitcoins. And so if I click this button, it's going to create a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, on the on the test net actually, not the real blockchain, because that costs money, uh, real money. But I will do it on the test Bitcoins test blockchain. And so I'll click that. And when I do, it gives me a transaction ID and I can go over to, um, what's it called? The uh, block explorer here. And I just created this transaction seconds ago, so it's not confirmed yet, but it's expected to confirm in one block. And down here, there is an op return, just like I was showing with Omni earlier. And if I click the details button, here is the signature. Uh, sorry, not there. Uh, here is the signature. Uh, and so this person can actually, uh, if, if he was um, 
uh, since he tried to import this token into his wallet, um, what he can do is he can like check the blockchain and see that if there is a signature on here um, that has been signed by um, uh, signed by the public key who sent him the tokens, then he can know that this uh, the person who had these tokens validly sent them to him. And how does he check if he's never sent it to anyone else? Well, he also checks the blockchain for that because if he's uh, the first um, uh, 80 characters on this are the, or first 40 characters I mean, are the person's public key. And if this public key ever appears on the blockchain with a signed transaction associated with it um, before he got this one, then that means this uh, the sender may have sent those tokens to somebody else. But uh, as long as this is the first time that this public key and signature have appeared, then that proves that he could, he never had an opportunity to send those coins to somebody else um, because it's not on the blockchain. Uh, so I'm going to get this signature from, um, actually I have to go back to here and get it from here. Uh, this is all supposed to be automated. I mentioned right here, the, the wallet is supposed to do these things automatically. It's supposed to scan the blockchain for this thing, check that there's no double spends and then get the signature, but I haven't automated it yet. So you have to do it all manually. And part of doing it all manually is just getting the last uh, 80 characters on this thing. So I have to go to a uh, character counter and do this all manually because I haven't automated it yet. I'm not that good of a developer and it takes me a while to do these things. But if I put this in here and then maybe subtract those, no, that's not enough. I'm trying to get this character count down to exactly 80 characters. So this is the signature. And if I insert that into here, uh, I also have to answer on this. this. It would do this automatically. It would make sure that the uh, issuer, uh, that the address which issued them is a valid, uh, is a valid issuer of this token. And uh, it would have already scanned the blockchain to make sure that this issuer never um, created this token before. And if all of that came true, it would automatically do all this. But here I have to do it manually. So it's assuming I've manually checked the blockchain to make sure this guy never did anything bad and that uh, I have um, well, got in, gotten his signature manually as you just saw me do. When I do all that, I can click confirm and it validated the signature. It validated that uh, the amount that he sent me um, is, uh, it was signed for properly. And now you can see my uh, transaction amount has increased to uh, 500. So that's how SigChain Wallet works. If you use the blockchain for it, uh, if you used the, um, the alternative method, if you use the side chain, then you would be checking the side chain for this data instead of Bitcoin's blockchain. Um, and I think I mentioned on here, let me go through the motions of issuing a token again. I mentioned on here that if you do commit to it on the side chain, you're doing that using the Lightning Network. And uh, it requires that you trust the person who's running the side chain briefly, but it's only brief because uh, the, the person who's running it, who I call an Oracle, he commits a batch of transactions to Bitcoin's blockchain every 2000 transactions. So if this was popular, he'd get 2000 transactions pretty quickly. And then all of those would get committed to on Bitcoin's blockchain afterwards. So you'd only have to trust him for like, you know, half an hour or something. And then you, it would all be on Bitcoin's blockchain, so you wouldn't need to trust them anymore. But by batching them together that way, you reduce the amount of fees because you only have to, like, he only has to pay like probably 300 bytes uh, in the transaction data. And he probably got 2000 sats if he's charging a, a one sat per transaction. He got 2000 sats and now has to give up 300 of them to the block, to Bitcoin's blockchain. And that's a hefty profit. Made like, it would make like 1700 sats on each batch. So that's the idea uh, of how my thing works. And at least it has a kind of half functioning wallet. You can issue transactions and send them to others, or you can issue them and send them in the same button. This guy can't yet send them uh, to anyone else. It does, that doesn't work yet, but the importing of them works and the issuing and issue slash sending of them uh, also works. So uh, does that answer the question you had about how you would, how you would do this client side validation um, I, I think the demo kind of shows how that works. Yeah, the, the validation part definitely made sense. That was a really good walkthrough. What would prevent um, someone else from, could anyone with like a SigChain wallet decode and basically see that information um, that was supposed to be private? Uh, no. how, how is that you... hidden from other people? Yeah, what they see on the SigChain 
um, the data they see is just this red part right here. And this does not, uh, this is only a fingerprint of the really important data. Um, but they, they also see the sender's address. The sender is the one in blue. And so they do see who's, uh, they see the public key of the person who sent the transaction. Uh, but they don't see who the recipient is or how much was sent to him or the other stuff. All of the, uh, for all of that, they only see this. They can't decode it without the key. Oh, that's in the hash. Okay, got it. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. And RGB also uses this technique to hide, hide data. In fact, I believe they also hide the sender, which I could not figure out how to do in my scheme. So there's definitely better than mine. And everyone should go use theirs. But, uh, you know, you never learn stuff unless you try to do it. Or I, I, I often learn stuff by trying to do it. So that's what I did. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's an excellent, excellent presentation and a walkthrough. Evan, see you, man. Thanks for, thanks for stopping in. Um, I, I have a question. I know we brought, or I, I, I know personally, I probably asked this at least in the RGB chats. And I think it's quite confusing for people that don't understand what it means. What is the word schema referring to in developer speak? Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it is a tough question to answer without using a lot of developer speak, <laughs> but um, uh, let me try to do it. Uh, I will first start with an analogy that is not going to make any sense unless you're also a developer. Um, but um, in Ethereum, which is where, uh, one of the more popular uh, blockchains for doing um, tokens, in Ethereum, in order to issue a token, you have to follow a standard called ERC-20. And this standard is something that all Ethereum wallets recognize. And if your coin is in this, in the format of this standard, then they can interact with it, even if they've never seen it before. Uh, they don't have, to, they don't have to like interpret special code or anything. It's all, it's all part of this one standard called ERC-20. And that's what schema is in uh, the RGB world. A wallet that wants to interact with a RGB token has to have a schema in it which is a standard for how to interact with that or with that um, type of token. Uh, and they're, they're coming up with a bunch of different schemas for various types of tokens, but um, or for various things you might want to do with tokens. But as long as your wallet has that schema downloaded, then even if it's never seen the token before that somebody sends to it, it can automatically know what to do with it, like what symbol to use and, and how many tokens there are that have been issued and, and all that stuff, because it's all part of this um, because it, it is encoded in a format that the wallet can recognize based on this schema standard. Uh, I know that is lots of developer talk, <laughs> and uh, I hope that helps no, a little bit. No, it makes sense. No, it makes sense. So basically a schema, and I just put it in the chat there. I, I know I'm butchering it most likely, but it's basically a set path, a set scheme, hence the word of whatever yeah. that wallet or protocol follows. Okay, that makes sense. And that's why, because that's what would always yeah, um, me. When you're, why when you're programming um, and you, t you, you send, uh, all programming involves sending text to a computer and hoping that it does something with the text. And if, yeah, you, yeah. if there's not a program on the computer that tells it what to do with the text you send it, uh, it won't do anything. <laughs> it just will not react. Uh, and Correct. so that, that is why a schema is needed is so that when it receives a piece of text that represents a token, uh, the, the computer, in this case, it'd probably be a cell phone, needs to know what to do with it. And that's what the schema tells it. It tells it, what, what should you do if this type of text comes to you? Got it. Makes perfect sense. Thank you. Just to ask one thing really quickly here. Uh, did you guys say you're going to record this or screen capture this whole presentation or something I heard at the beginning? Yes, I have it recorded, and you are on the recording as of right now. And I will okay. put in the chat uh, the YouTube page that it will be uploaded to. So okay, I great, yeah, because I'm I'm certainly gonna have to go over this a few more times to get it. It's it's an awful lot <laughs> to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, it def yeah, d d definitely that's, for the first. That's what happens when you get a developer draft. trying to do a presentation. It's, uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's it's it's, it's 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 well, it's, I guess it's a good thing. I mean, it's it forces you to. Uh, learn an awful lot. There's a lot, a lot of terms I have never heard before that I'm going to have to go a little more deeper into kind of get a handle on. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you very much. That's, that's wow. You don't usually get this much in-depth information from any meetup anywhere <laughs> of any kind. Yeah, this is so a very thank you. Yeah. meetup. 
Yeah, we definitely can get very technical in the weeds, but I'm very gracious of all of the participants like Super Testnet um, in here and other developers as well that have come uh, either on lightning talks or privacy talks, so on and so forth. We have miners in here, uh, so we can get quite in depth on pretty much any level of uh, Bitcoin that anybody really sees fit. But I will, I'm finding the link right now that I will upload the video to. And I will share that momentarily. Any other questions or comments? All yeah, right. right. Oh, there you go. Um, every, yeah, thank you everybody for, for listening on this. Again, Super, I know this was your first draft uh, just to kind of get it out. And um, I greatly appreciate uh, everything that you you did in there um, as well. So I will upload. I know I I went over this presentation yesterday with Max, and I think the main the only thing I changed is the demo. Uh, yesterday I did not have a wallet, and today I do. So I think Max probably appreciates that it's easier to follow when there's a wallet that you can see what's happening in it. Yes, it's much easier to to follow along with a wallet like that. Even a very basic black and white thing. Yeah, even yeah, it, it wasn't even terminal. It was it was generally you know generally back, uh, uh, at least viewable for for that. But again, thank you, super. Thank you.